Okay. Let's move on. Are you getting tired? No, I am. Okay. Let's see how far I managed to teach. Okay, we can, of course, we can. Now we have a function, haven't we? We have c as a function of the variable pc. So we can plot this function if you like, and uh, that is done on the next slide. You see, it's a nice smooth curve here. It's called, uh, what is it called, this kind of curve? Do you know the name of it? You don't. No. It's called an hyperbola. This is a hyperbola. Yeah, it, it's the structure of 1 over x, isn't it? That's a hyperbola. It has uh, asymptotes in both directions. It never becomes zero, it never becomes, never crosses the first or the second line. So it's. Um, and this is, of course, an example of a nonlinear demand curve. It's, it's not a straight line. It's very much far from a straight line, actually. It's a very curved line. OK. Now, before we move on, so far, what we have done today. Is there anything which is especially relevant when I if you think about sports or events here in what we have done today? Have we made any assumptions here which kind of does not hold if you look at sport and event markets compared to other markets? Or is this completely general? Can we tell this? Yeah, yes, Matt? We haven't talked about changing preferences here, have we? Well, that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. Be but that is different because then we suddenly look into a time perspective. Now we kind of look at a glimpse of time, mm -hmm. and when we say that we keep the preferences, of course we mean that. So if you look at a glimpse of time into athletes, as you say, then of course, what kind of the preferences we look at here is the consumer preferences. So if you look at athletes, if you look at U.S. Base basketball ball stores, basketball stars. Then, of course, it's your preferences related to those. How much would you pay to, what's their names, these guys? I don't know. You know. Who's the most famous basketball player in the States today? LeBron James. LeBron James? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Everybody knew. OK. Did you know this, Eric? <laughs> the second most famous basketball, store, basketball star? It's hard to yeah, say. There's some argument. I don't know. Kevin Durant, maybe? OK. So there is some, yeah. In the old days, old days it used to be Michael Jordan, Jordan yeah was it his stuff now haven't he yeah. Has, hasn't he yeah He's okay awesome. <laughs> yeah he was well, he was playing for the you know Chicago Black Horse Hawks is it something yeah. called that yeah, Chicago. the Chicago Black Horse is a hockey team maybe yeah, ah <laughs> okay you see my knowledge about US sports it's it's not very good but in general as I see it there is really nothing we have learned today, which kind of is relevant when it comes to, apart from one thing. And that's the argument I, say, I said here, that it could be that in sports and event settings, it's much more often we kind of have this problem of limited number of uh, producers or consumers and possible coalitions and cooperation and gaming situations, okay? So again, that argument is perhaps the most important one when it comes to comparing at large microeconomics to uh, uh, or using microeconomics when it comes to to sport and event markets but basically the arguments we made today they are kind of uh, market independent in a sense it's it's kind of a straightforward argument we assume existence of utility function and if you're inter interested in paying money to go for a football match or buying potatoes, that's kind of the same thing, isn't it? You, you need to have some preferences. You need to find out whether to use these 100 crowns to go to the match or to use it to something else. So these kind of decisions doesn't change, whether it's sport, or theater, or whatever. Okay? It's, the, it's the same kind of, of problem, so to speak. So it's, it's if we were to discuss it, it would be maybe it's harder to make a trade-off between these, should we say, entertainment services? Maybe it's easier. I don't know. Uh, in general, what we have said is that the demand for 
entertainment at large is more price sensitive and that's an important point okay it's we, we know that if people get poor then they get rid of entertainment they start buying uh, potatoes and if they can afford it meat okay uh, or uh, as we did in Norway we we bought potatoes and fish okay that was uh, the, le the least expensive in uh, back in the old days when half of the Norwegian population emigrated to the US the the, p the poorness was extreme actually it, um, do you any of you have any Norwegian ancestors no Matt you're not of Norwegian heritage no there's a TV program now you should see that it's called what's it called is it yeah. yeah have you seen it <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, you should watch that program, Alt for Norge. It's on TV Norge, TVN. It's these uh, Norwegian Americans coming to Norway trying to learn Norwegian. Yeah, they, uh, it's kind of a cultural uh, learning, isn't it? At least for, for those of you coming outside of Norway, because they kind of stress what's Norwegian, what's special in Norwegian. Of course, it's not much culture in microeconomics, at least not, not so far. But, uh, let's hope it. Uh, Yes, of course you can, Monica. Okay. It was Monica, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, when can you say that a consumer has uh, attained maximum satisfaction when they attend an event? When I can say uh, as a maximum satisfaction. Yeah. Assuming they're going to watch a musician perform, and then the sound system. No, y you know what we've done here is not to achieve the maximum satisfaction satisfaction but to achieve the maximum satisfaction given a certain amount of money okay so we do a kind of constraint thing here we have a certain amount of money let's try to get as much satisfaction as we can out, out of those money choosing between uh, meat and potatoes or food and clothing okay so these concepts of maximal satisfaction is something different yeah, well, I don't know whether there is something called maximal satisfaction I assume uh, most human beings are never satisfied to some extent, it seems to me at least. You always want more. The greed is kind of always there. The more you get, the more greedy you get. It seems to me. Because this is just observing from outside. It doesn't seem like people who are rich get less greedy, does it? Do you have that impression? Yeah. You have that impression? I don't have that impression. I have the opposite impression. I get the feeling that the richer people are, the more they want. They are getting even the more they get, the more greedy they get. Yeah. But humans are greedy in nature. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But now we're talking about the dynamicness of greediness. Is it related to the amount you have, for instance? My experience is that poor people are less greedy than rich people. But this is just my experience. I have no proof on this. These are kind of more philosophy than microeconomics. So now we are moving into another field. You see all these rich guys, you know, they, or girls for that matter, they do all kind of crazy stuff, don't they? They, they cheat, they lie, they steal, they kill, they sell drugs, they whatever, okay. Okay. But uh, my main point was actually that what we have discussed today is really nothing which is kind of separating. This is kind of common, should we say, for sports economics or event economics or fishery economics or whatever type of economics this is kind of general okay it's kind of it's the building block <laughs> so the changes comes later so to speak okay or we have of course already discussed something related to demand when we finish this consumption theory part and we move into production theory and production theory is perhaps more relevant when, it, when we discuss events and sport because the production structure is different here, isn't it? <coughs> uh, what's the main difference in when it comes to revenue generation if we compare, let's say, uh, sports arrangements or selling cars? There is some major differences here, isn't it? Yes. If you sell sports arrangements, the, the sources of revenue come from many parts. Okay, you get tickets, you get sponsors, you get TV revenue, so there's a, a whole pile of different revenue parts as opposed to more classical manufacturing or production where you kind of sell your car, you, 
you get your price, you sell another car, you get the same price and so on. Okay, so it's much more complicated when it comes to this entertainment business in general, because there's a lot of revenue sources. Authors, for instance, they sell, of course, their books, but they also get royalties. Know what the royalty is? Have anybody of you ever received royalties? No, that's what you get if you... Yeah, it's related to, you know, copyright stuff, and you, you get some money if you... If you're a composer of a certain tune, you get some money rolling by, okay, for each time it's played and that kind of stuff. So you, you kind of both earn money on the event itself as well as kind of the, the future after the event, so to speak. Okay, if you take if you tape a live live concert, you you get the tickets money from from that live live concert. But if you put it on a DVD, you can sell it for years to come. Okay. So so these are kind of important uh, differences. Okay, and of course, what we already have discussed related to at least sports this competitive element that you need to have competitors to, to make the revenue. That's something which kind of is very different from all other kinds of economic activity. Okay, uh, let's move on a little bit. We ended there, didn't we? That was the plot of these the Monker. Okay, now if we want to look at the shift in the demand curve, that's also straightforwardly understood by this theory, so to speak. A shift in the demand curve is easily explained by applying this method, assume now that the consumer's income increases from 80 to 120. Okay, then we can repeat the previous calculations, only changing 80 to 120. So where it previously was 80, now it's 120 minus PC times C times C, and then you get the utility function in one variable, you take the derivative, you equate it to zero, and then you end up Instead of having 40 over PC, you get 120 over 2 PC, which is 60 over PC. Of course, that's a new demand curve, isn't it? If you draw them in the same diagram, of course, you see the shift directly. So you see, it's, it's, very s it's really very straightforward to kind of uh, see directly now what we mean by this shift. Okay, It's just a simple change in the parameter. And the idea of these shifts, as I told you, is instead of looking at many variables in the function, in this case there are more of them, isn't it? We have the i as well as the pf, okay? So it could be many dimensions here. We have to put into the utility first. So to keep it at a reasonable level, we keep most things constant and we, we vary a little. But uh, given this thing, it's straightforward to, to look at, uh, at shifts. And, and this is a classical si shift, of course, what happens is that the the mount curve moves from the blue starting point upwards into this red final point where the, where the income suddenly has increased from 80 to 120. That is a 40% change, is it? 4 times 8? No. I'm bad at head math. Ah, it doesn't really matter. It's a certain change, okay? If it had, f it's more than that. It was, oh, it was 8, yeah. Uh, okay, who cares? So you see, uh, then we kind of get an easy way of constructing these shifts given that we have the necessary information. But in most cases, when we do analysis here, for instance on this general equilibrium model with this market cross, then we just say, oh no, suppose something happens, and then we, then we, uh, we move one of these curves in one direction, and then we can see what happens. But you see, we can do it kind of directly correctly, mathematically stringent, given that we have the information. Okay, there's something called the Engel curve. Engel is uh, perhaps was a German economist many years ago, and uh, of course, instead of keeping I constant and change PC, we can do the opposite and repeat our previous calculations, can't we? I mean, instead of kind of thinking of PC as the variable, we can think of I as the one which changes, or as the per parameter here. And then, of course, uh, we can do the same kind of calculation, but instead of having <coughs> PC here and 80 or 120 there, we can flip them. Okay, so now we go back to our two and have a parameter for i. Of course, the calculations work exactly as before. Of course, not exactly, but close to exactly. We multiply together to get ic 
there and 2c squared there. You take the derivative. Of course, c is the variable, so the derivative then remains this as a constant, which ends there, and it's 4c equals to 0, and then we get i star equal to 4c, or i star equal to 4qc, as we may use to uh, be. Where do I get the 2c? Where do I get the 2c? Yeah. These 2c? I substitute back the original. Previously, there was PC here, the price of clothing. But now I want to look at income instead. So I let that be a parameter, and I keep only one parameter at a time here, to not to make it too complex. And then I move back to the original, which was the price O2 on clothing, wasn't it? Let's see. Yeah, you can see there, there is 2C. It's the same 2C here, okay? So that's, we move back to the original, but, but let i change. And of course then you see that the form of our curve changes, doesn't it? <coughs> oh, this is suddenly a curve which looks like this, isn't it? Here is i and here is q. So an angle curve is a functional relation between income and quantity. A demand curve is a functional relation between price and quantity, and they, they, they behave differently. Recall that our demand curve was looked looking like this in this case. This function is named an angle curve. This could be interesting, stating how the demand for a certain product, in this case clothing, would change if and when the consumer's income changes. This is relevant decision support for any manufacturer, isn't it, or a shop? If you get some news that some governmental agents are interested in uh, increasing people's income, then you can see some effect of that on how much you sell, of course. This type of info makes it possible for a producer to predict how and much more one will sell of a given product if, for instance, consumer in income increases. Now these angle curves, they has made impact to another concept called normal versus inferior goods. And it says here, if demand for a certain good increases, when income increases, that's the typical thing, isn't it? That people get more money, then they start buying more of everything, and the good we look at should they also buy more of in norm normally. And this good is called a normal good. If, however, demand decreases when income increases, meaning that people get more, more money but they buy less of this product, we call the good inferior. And it says here, rental versus sold flats could be an example. Do you see that? You know, rental flats, at least in Norway, is something that people really don't like to do. Okay, but they have to, to live somewhere. They would really like to buy their own, because the kind of capitalization on that is better. So if your income is uh, relatively low, you're not able to buy a flat. But so then you have to rent. Okay. But if these guys get more money, they would immediately jump into the buying market. Of course, then the demand for the rented flat would go down. Okay, so increase in income leads to reduction in demand in that case. So this rented flat is a good example. Can we think of any other examples of inferior goods? Now is the time to be creative here. Maybe some cheap stuff like rice? Yeah. Cheap food, for instance, yeah, you know, rotten fish <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Uh, you, you have to buy it, you don't have enough money to get the real thing, so of course when you get enough money then you then you get a decrease in the demand for this stuff. So uh, rice is uh, perhaps uh, a very good example, of course. But rice is not inferior. No, it's not inferior. Mm. Rental flats are not inferior e either in a sense, if that's what you put behind the word. But in this sense it is. What about sport or uh, event goods? Can we think of anything inferior there?
due to the fact, the fact that you have too little money here. That could be a case, couldn't it? You know, suppose you live in Barcelona, okay? Now our friend from Spain, do you have any other football teams than Barcelona in Barcelona? Yeah. Espanol? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there are two. Uh, Espanol is, is kind of a good team, isn't it? They are in pre Premier, what do you call La it? Liga. La Liga. They are in La Liga, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect perhaps the prices to be that different, but suppose there are the price differentially, so it's kind of cheap to go to these Espanol matches, but very expensive to go to Barcelona matches. It could be that many of these sport consumers really would like to go and watch Barcelona, but they don't have enough money. So they are using Espanol as a substitute. No, that's not right. Of course it's not right. These are heavy supporters, either for Espanol or for Barcelona. So it, it's not right. So this is like the American way of thinking. You know, in Europe, there are, there are s people are tied to their team. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard to find these examples in general. But it could be that, you know, you don't see as much. You don't see kind of a, a movie which is cheap and another one is six. It's kind of the same price, isn't it? All these movies, whether they are good or bad or whatever. It's, uh, pricing is not used as a kind of separation here. So it's it's much harder to find examples of inferior goods in uh, in the in entertainment industry. I, I think it's it's not that easy. Yeah, here is an example of a real world angle curve. Um, here is entertainment. You can see this one. It rises nicely as it should. Okay, an angle curve for a normal good should go like this or like this, okay? It should, when there is more income, you should get more sold. The same more or less holds for um, healthcare here. You can see maybe not, there is a little drop up back here, isn't it, for healthcare? How could that be? Could it be that people use bad drugs here because they can't afford to get the right ones? Not drugs, but you don't you know what I mean when I say drugs. Now it's not uh, like sports people doping. That's not the type of drugs I think about. But you know, normal drugs used to cure diseases. It could be that uh, some of these are expensive. We know they are, don't, don't we? There are certain drugs who are extremely expensive, and it's perhaps not surprising to that you can observe patterns around certain annual expenditure levels or wage levels if you like uh, which could have angle curves that kind of curves back but you see the classical example here the, the rented dwellings what is the dwelling i never heard that word is that a flat or something place to live. Place to live. it's a place to live i thought that was either called a house or a flat but this is a kind of a synonym then Oh, it's a common term. So it means places to live. It's not a, it's not a specific kind. Like housing. Yeah. Okay. And you see here, it's going a lot back here. At a certain level here, $2,500, as it says here, it's, uh, people start buying dwellings instead of renting them. Average per household expenditures on rented dwellings, healthcare, and entertainment are plotted as functions of annual income. Healthcare and entertainment are normal goods. It says here, even though we can question it slightly here, you see you have a little back here. So there's a little element of moving back here. But according to the, it's perhaps so little that you, you kind of judge it as normal good, but this is inferior. It goes, goes significantly from the right to the left. <coughs> okay. Okay. So to some extent, you see, at this point, we can kind of start using microeconomics, okay? It kind of gives us some information. We can separate some goods in different types. It, uh, it's possible to make classifications related to, to these kind of things, for instance. And we also have this theory that kind of makes it structurally easy, at least, to see how we can kind of find the things we, we plot here. So this angle curve is kind of relatively straightforward to, to
to derive given that of course we have these utility functions which we by the way no almost never have but uh, but uh, there is a kind of logical build up here which uh, leads to to this okay i think we leave income and substitution effects for tomorrow yeah we do so this is enough for today thank you for your patience thank you for today. and have a nice evening and by all means consume entertainment okay consume entertainment watch tv read books go to the movies watch football whatever you like okay I will just turn this off Monica and then I will try to